I'd like to welcome you very much to this event today as part of the Material World series at the Warburg Institute. I'm Louisa McKenzie, one of the organizers, alongside my colleague Rembrandt Deltz. Um, the theme for this year is private versus public. Um, we are very pleased to invite a speaker for this first event, Dr. Caroline McCaffrey Howarth. Um, who's going to speak to us about revolutionary histories on handheld ceramics. Dr. McCaffrey Howarth is an art historian and curator who specializes in the visual and material cultures of early modern Europe. She is lecturer in French and British history of art, C 1650 to 1900, at the University of Edinburgh. Caroline was previously curator of 1600 to 1800 ceramics and glass at the V&A Museum and lecturer in the history of design for the Royal College of Art with the V&A. She's currently writing two books, one on the art collector and philanthropist Lady Charlotte Schreiber for Lund Humphreys, which should appear in 2024, and a forthcoming monograph entitled Sèvres Mania, The Craft of Ceramics Connoisseurship for Bloomsbury Academic, which will arrive in 2025. Before we begin, I would just like to remind all attendees that we are recording tonight's event. Thank you very much and over to you, Caroline. Would you like to share your screen? Brilliant, thanks so much, Louisa. Yes, let me just get everything set up. Good. Can you just let me know, is that all worked? Um, that looks good for me. Okay, brilliant, great. Oh, well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction and a huge thank you uh, to the Institute and also to yourself and Rembrandt for inviting me to speak today and uh, for all of, the, all of the organization. This uh, talk, which I think will be about 35, 40 minutes uh, on revolutionary histories on handheld ceramics from the 1790s is very much part of a larger research project on the role of ceramics and their distinct materiality and their roles as historical agents, as historical record in the early modern period. Today, by embracing what Alden Kavanagh and Michael Yonan have termed the cultural aesthetics of ceramics, I want to contextualize these objects within the broader socio-cultural framework in which they were designed, produced and consumed. And as hopefully I'll show throughout this talk, these printed ceramics raise quite significant questions about the complex nature of counter and pro-revolutionary sentiment in England during the 1790s. So by tracking the depiction of the visual iconography of the French Revolution through these objects, I want us to think about how the process of scaling down these large scale events um, med politics and also the emerging histories of the French Revolution accessible to a much broader public and in doing so created a form of political engagement and visual shorthand for users of these ceramic vessels in the 1790s. Now I should just mention straight away that some of this research has recently been published in two new books. Uh, firstly, Small Things in the 18th Century, uh, The Political and Personal Value of the Miniature, which came out a couple of months ago, published by Cambridge University Press and edited by Chloe Wigston Smith and Beth Fox Tobin. And also Pots, Prints and Politics, a book by the British Museum, edited by Patricia Ferguson, which came out last year. And I just have to thank all three editors really for helping to shape my thinking or my initial thinking around this project. Um, I'm really, really grateful to them. So between the years of 1793 and 96, a proliferation of small creamware ale mugs and jugs transfer printed in enamel were made by regional English ceramic factories. They depicted scaled down images of two of the most well publicized historical moments of the French Revolution, and that's to say the final farewell of Queen Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI with their family, which happened the night before his execution, and uh, a focus on the guillotine of the actual um, execution of the king. So these are kind of two uh, key events which are found on these objects. So for example, here I'm showing you a Staffordshire mug printed the last interview and farewell of the king with his family. 
um, and you can see it's mirrored in the print beside it. So we think that the source of the image for the mug uh, was probably quite a rare engraving published by C. Shepherd, who were based at number 15, St. Peter's Hill in London, and they specialise in making cheap prints for a popular market, especially ballads. But I think the plain window and the kind of rather humble setting and the sort of triangular um, pieta like composition of the figures stylistically share similarities with a hand-coloured etching by Isaac Cruikshanks um, published in March 1793. And I'm showing you uh, that here on the right-hand side. This um, image is now at the British Museum. And I should say the mugs at the v in in the Europe galleries. The now very well-known plotter, businessman and abolitionist Josiah Wedgwood commented that the French Revolution was, and I quote, a very sudden and momentous event from its beginning. And I spoke speed and the rapid response of the French Revolution and the distribution of its visual imagery onto the material of ceramics is one of the things that I'm most interested in in exploring with this particular project. Produced quickly in England following the, in the years following the execution of the French king, now only a few examples of these French revolutionary ceramics actually remain. And really for the purposes of time this evening, I'm going to focus purely on one category and that is the guillotine. And I'm showing you some examples, two jugs here and, and an example of another mug as well on the screen. These were so often based on popular print culture, and therefore such objects raise questions regarding the intermedial nature of ceramics production, representations of history, and the performative nature of the political experience during this time. This interchange between media, a topic although often discussed by art and design historians, and design historians often neglects to include ceramics as part of the conversation. So instead, my paper this evening argues that such ceramics embodied currency as historical agents, producing meaning and constructing narratives of political rhetoric. Taking Bruno Latour's assertion that artifacts are non-human objects imbued with agency, I ask what role did these ceramics play within the visual, material and haptic quotidian political experience? And therefore, what should historians of the French Revolution, and tonight I'm thinking specifically about England's response to that, what should we do with these objects? How can we think of them as handheld forms of history in the making? Now, undoubtedly, these printed jugs and mugs participated in the established genre of print culture during the French Revolution, which, as I'm sure many of you will know, was an effective engine for the circulation of political ideologies in both France and England at this time. So in Paris, for example, we think that at least 40,000 prints and pamphlets were produced quickly and in large quantities with engravings featuring on large folio sheets or illustrated broadsides and they were soon disseminated across Europe and led their way to England. Rolf Reichardt has more recently likened the print culture during the French Revolution to one of the first European media events as it offered what he terms a democratization of political mass communication. And I think it is useful for us to add the visual and material culture of ceramics into these wider discussions around this democratization of political thought um, and historical consciousness at this point. So first up, I'd just like us to start by uh, sort of introducing the material processes behind these objects. So all of the objects that I'm showing you this evening are transfer printed. Um, so the first stage of, sort of transfer printing was to engrave a design onto the surface of a copper plate. And then transfer plate printing essentially involved covering the engraved copper plate in a type of oil, um, typically linseed oil. The oil was then picked up by these flexible slabs or glue bats, uh, which were covered in gelatinous glue. And then they were um, kind of, you know, removed from the copper and then derived, uh, applied directly onto the ceramic body. And here you can just sort of see the process um, being done in a slightly more... Uh, 
um, rustic kind of fashion, but essentially the same thing of, of kind of cutting the glue bats, um, putting the uh, oil onto the engraved plates, and then pressing that onto the ceramic body itself. Then the blue bat is taken away and uh, left with a design and typically a, a powdered enamel color is then dusted onto the oily design and the excess of that is eventually removed. Often manufacturers at this point, at the end of the 18th century, were commissioning local engravers to make detailed etched copper plates or for the most part, probably they were buying finished copper um, engraved plates from places like Liverpool or also from London. Printed creamware in Britain had become something that was relatively affordable as a product aimed at the middle and the labouring classes by the end of the century. It really starts in the 1750s, transfer printed creamwares, um, gain huge commercial successes in Britain and um, very much championed by a Liverpool firm, a firm based in Liverpool called Sadler and Green, who are even doing transfer printing for the likes of Wedgwood, for example. And quite often you find that the printed image might cover the whole ceramic surface or it might be framed in an oval or kind of circular format. It might be accompanied by decorative borders like laurel leaves or branches or sprays, or sometimes it will actually have text um, accompanying the image printed on with it as well. So I suppose my question here is, why should we be looking at these types of ceramic? Whilst many scholars have paid attention to the visual and material phenomena of the French Revolution, few studies have really centered on ceramics as historical and political agents. Notably, Harriet Guest has dismissed these uh, types of creamwares as merely, and I quote, for popular edification and consumption. And for me, I think that there's a disciplinary boundary at play here, as art, art historians traditionally have not engaged seriously with the materiality and importance or potential cultural importance of these ceramics. For example, we know that lots of historians have considered the revolutionary ties of painting, of sculpture, design, architecture, et cetera, but not so much um, the objects like these that we're seeing on the screen this evening. Although I should mention, of course, David Bynman and Joan Landers have mentioned the existence of these types of mugs and jugs, but more so in passing rather than as central points of discussion. And I suppose as an extension to that, it's also important uh, for me to mention that thankfully work by the likes of Richard Tawes and also Iris Moon has certainly in more recent years opened up the conversations surrounding the types of objects and the types of things that historians of the French Revolution are starting to pay attention to. So I suppose I see my, my work kind of fitting into this um, more general shift that has been occurring over the last few years. So I'm showing you uh, here a mug with a guillotine scene, which I'm going to come back to in, in a lot more detail. But just I want to, I guess, at this point, think uh, about how these objects were used, um, in what kind of circumstances were they in private public spaces, and potentially think a bit more about their use and their function and how that relates to the image that we're actually seeing um, on the surface of the ceramic body as well. So the majority of these mugs uh, range from about 8.7 centimetres to 15 centimetres in height. So because of that, these printed revolutionary ceramic mugs can be identified as either half quart or full quart uh, mugs for ale. And the accompanying jugs that I've shown you, and I'll, you'll see a few more in a minute, they would have been used for pouring the ale. So it's most likely that these were objects which were used in domestic settings, that is to say perhaps the private kind of realms of the home, or they were used in taverns. And I guess, you know, we could spend a lot of time thinking about the public private binary of the tavern, but I suppose in, in my uh, mind, we're seeing the tavern as a much more public sphere at, at this point. So what does it mean to reduce a complex French political event to an image printed on a quite daily functional everyday material object? which primarily was maybe used in a British tavern or alehouse. Did such printed ceramics shape the way ordinary and everyday people saw or engaged with the French Revolution and its ideals? And if so, did it foster radical or reactionary ideas through its imagery? As objects that were used and exchanged within the tavern space, these mugs and jugs formed what 
sort of part of what John Mee has called the conversable world, in the sense that they were made for settings that produce conversations about current cultural events. And I suppose, of course, at this point, we have to remember that by 1792 and into the mid 90s, at least 30 English towns had established radical corresponding societies and reformist clubs, several of which met regularly in taverns. And John Mee has investigated the distinct convivial sociability that emerged through radical tavern culture at this point in the 1790s. And in particular, he emphasizes the power of what he calls print magic within these spaces, um, which essentially emerges from the idea that you have uh, leaflets and prints circulating and, and liberating mankind um, because of its existence and dissemination through print culture. So I suppose, you know, how do we, how do these objects further this idea of that notion of print magic? perhaps is something to think about. With this in mind, these ceramics offered users the opportunity to hold the mugs in their hands and bring their scaled down images closer to their eyes, providing a multi-sensory engagement with the objects. They invited a different kind of political engagement and representation to textual forms of print in a historical moment in which, and I think this is important for us to remember, by 1795, only 60% of English men were literate. So you're really, you know, this idea of very you know, old school idea of a picture says a thousand words, but I think there is something within that to maybe hold on to as we continue to look at these objects. As functional objects, these ceramic vessels also had the potential to influence or play a part in the social practices of tavern culture through songs, toasts, political gestures, and by provoking debate or argument. And we're going to come to that in, in a little bit in the talk. Transfer printing, therefore, enabled an increased production of relatively inexpensive ceramics that were both decorative and utilitarian, not perhaps aesthetically pleasing, especially when we see um, kind of the, the blood literally uh, uh, dripping on an example like this, but they were decorative and they were still functional and they were relatively cheap. They could be afforded by a, you know, a good number of people. So for example, a print transfer printed creamware uh, punch bowl, uh, which would have been fairly large in size, retailed at about two to five shillings and a set of blue printed teacups and saucers um, coming from a factory in, at Swansea in the 1790s only cost two shillings and that's for a whole set. So, you know, I think we're, we are really dealing with objects that, that could be afforded um, quite easily. So with that in mind, these printed ceramics are not only addressing, um, but also catering to non-elite social groups. And that really underscores how these small scale images would have offered that group of society access to these revolutionary events. And as Richard Tollers has argued, the production of ephemeral printed objects very much negotiated this historical significance of the revolution at this time. So such uh, pictorial propaganda opened access to current socio-political events to non or semi-literate audiences. And although many of these printed ceramics were inspired by, or as we'll see, directly copied from well-known French print sources, close analysis reveals that they did not merely replicate large scale counterpart images, but often they actually reinterpreted them or they created hybrid versions based on the original prints. Other issues kind of namely constraints of space also determined the process of scaling down as often the image presented on the ceramic surface was perhaps truncated or, or, you know, kind of missed part of the original visual source because it was cramped together onto a smaller surface. As many scholars have addressed, the British reaction to the French Revolution was incredibly complex. And I have to sort of beg forgiveness. I'm really uh, dialing all of this down um, and diluting it into quite a, um, a short space of time given, given time constraints. So, so please do forgive me on that. Uh, but essentially, the British reaction was very complex um, and absolutely shifted as the French Revolution uh, continued as its kind of trajectory evolved. 
with defenders and critics sometimes changing positions in response to the contemporary events that were happening in Paris. At its beginning, many British writers and political thinkers have praised the equality of the French Revolution as the epitome of 18th century Enlightenment principles. Yet growing violence in France, um, particularly in, from August 1792 and the uprising against the monarchy, um, which had a, you know, a fully overthrown Louis XVI, soon led to British anxiety. And so with this in mind, it's perhaps not surprising to think that the executions of the French king and queen and the pervading news of the terror led to a growing concern in England for the longevity of monarchical structures, as many feared a radical uprising would occur, you know, in on English soil, as it were. A range of publications soon appeared that attempted to capture the immediate history of the French Revolution, including things like John Gifford's A Narrative of the Transactions Personally Relating to Louis XVI, uh, from his evasion from Paris to his death in 1793, an English translation in 1794, of Monsieur de Viette's short biography of Marie Antoinette, which detailed her life and her trial and her execution, as well as things like Mary Wollstonecraft's um, and historical and moral view of the origin and progress of the French Revolution and its effect in Europe, published in 1794. So capitalizing on this rising public interest surrounding the final moments of the French royal family in Britain, factories quickly reproduced a range of printed ceramics depicting the king's final moments. So here we have another farewell scene. Um, this one is actually based on an original drawing by Henry Singleton, uh, but it's showing this again the last interview of Louis XVI with his family. And we can see him gesturing to the crucifix on the wall as Marie Antoinette um, uh, consoles him and you know, falls into his arms. But you'll notice that there is a sort of distinct difference here between some of the printed imagery uh, published of this, of this um, image that ends up on the mug, uh, which I think is quite interesting. So for example, on the mug, we've got the crucifix, but you'll notice here that in the engraving, we actually have a globe um, and that is because the mug itself is actually based on a little known engraving by John Jones, which was after an original by Henry Singleton. Uh, but essentially the that original print is very much highlighting the King's Catholic faith or perhaps his resignation to God at this point, you know, the final night before his death. But I think it's interesting to maybe ask why the potters are deciding to use, or the designer of the copper plate is deciding to use um, the lesser known print showing the crucifix rather than the one that circulated much more widely, which as we can see here has Louis pointing at a globe um, right on the, on the top of a bookcase in the corner. And I suppose what's interesting then are the questions that start to arise about how and why the designer is choosing one print over another. Is it simply based on availability or opportunity, or does it suggest a form of artistic agency over the political message that that mug is therefore going to, to give out to its user? But as I said, for the essence of sort of time, I'm going to really focus on the guillotine mugs. Uh, the guillotine, of course, uh, was very much considered to be the most humane method of execution during the Enlightenment. It was deemed uh, and has been deemed to be both an image and a producer of images. And it was certainly something which uh, attracted attention, not just in France, but also in England during the French Revolution. So, for example, immediately following King Louis XVI's death, Many Londoners actually attended exhibitions of working guillotines, um, which you know were said to be the exact same guillotine model that had killed the King and, and Marie Antoinette. So, for example, at number 45, Oxford Street, they even had reduced entry fees for tradesmen and for servants to come and see these working guillotines and kind of engage in that visual performance. There was also a proliferation of visual and written texts that were disseminated widely and which described in great detail the massacre of the king and queen of France. 
And often it is known as this in French culture, you see quite a lot, it's literally written the cruel massacre, the massacre of the king or of the king and queen. One pamphlet even noted how the king was, and I, and I quote, fastened to a board which reached no higher than his breast, led along his belly with his head through the hole in the two boards. And while some visual illustrations embraced a more satirical tone, for example, caricatures by people like James Gilray, others struck a much more gruesome line. The wonderful magazine, for example, um, which this, uh, uh, this printed mug is, is based on that image. As you can see, it shows blood dripping from the sharp blade of the guillotine, um, spurting out over the king's, uh, through the king's severed body into a basket and it overflows as the blood sort of seeps over the scaffold. Uh, great. Just before dinner, I'm really aware that as I'm saying all of this, you know, we're in a, a sort of six o'clock anyway. Um, but I think what's very interesting here is that the print itself um, has been gilled down and then directly translated onto the creamware mug. Um, and this mug was printed in Staffordshire. The mug is signed by John Ainsley. Uh, a pot engraver and pot printer based at Lean End in Staffordshire, and Ainsley depicts visually and textually who and what was present at the execution. So he's almost willing his illustration into a tangible record of recent political events, a handheld form of history in the making. The guillotine occupies the central point of the image, perhaps no surprise there. To the right, we have the executioner brandishing Louis XVI's head, um, holding it up to the crowd as blood continues to drip downwards. And to the left, we have the commandant general, Antoine Joseph Santerre, who holds a sword um, upright, confirming that justice has, has now been served to the French people. Ainsley captures the immediate aftermath of the murder of the king, emphasizing those who witnessed it, who were responsible for the execution. And you'll notice that each figure is literally um, identified through a number of key systems. So for example, um, we've got number one, which is the guillotine, um, which is at the very top of the um, object. We've got number two to signify the ax, number three to signify the body of the king, um, and so on and so forth. In the process of scaling down the visual imagery, Ainsley has positioned the figures much more closer together um, and printed them quite tightly onto the bottom section of the mug. So they're quite cramped details when you actually start to look at it up close. And I think that's quite interesting because it shows it would have really required quite a close scrutiny by the mugs, tavern users to make out um, the figures and the numbers and, and the text um, underneath as well, which kind of lays it all out. And as someone like Lynn Hunt has observed, not only did the French Revolution challenge old paradigms, it also created new ones by enabling ordinary people across Europe to reclaim and reimagine their role within current socio-political and cultural events. And here the user could study and handle a piece of popular culture, perhaps reveling in the gore, exploring a potentially treasonous plot of their own, or even chastising the violence of the French. Or even perhaps they could interpret this detailed scene as a form of commemoration, maybe more so in line with the traditional commemorative transfer with printed ceramics, which you see produced in England from the mid 18th century onwards. But nevertheless, I think through these subjective and haptic interactions, users access a range of sensory and potentially conversational ways to engage with the recent history of the French Revolution, which this mug is marking. And as someone like Leora Auslander has suggested, such objects not only are the product of history, but they are also active agents in history. So the revolutionary imagery of small things simultaneously captured political current political events, and also had the potential to shape the historical record and circulate everyday understandings of the French Revolution. Ainsley's mug, therefore, I think, very much was participating in a broader popular and morbid fascination with the guillotine, uh, and which was very much marked by an increase in Republican and pro-revolutionary sentiment, especially in London and other cities. And we know that interest in the guillotine was fueled very much by the growth of egalitarian moral philosophy, 
um, championed by people like Mary Wollstonecraft in her vindication of the rights of men, as well as Thomas Paine's rights of man. Galvanized by the radical press, these texts circulated widely. We know 20,000 copies were sent to the north of Ireland, as well as to Sheffield, to Leeds and to Liverpool. And you have the corresponding societies uh, first based, uh, first established in Sheffield and then in London from 1791 onwards, which were further kind of seeking to educate the ordinary person about the egalitarian nature of parliamentary reform. And we know that corresponding societies often were issuing cheap copies of Paine's Rights of Man. So following the death of the king, the French king in 1793, there's this idea of... Um, of kind of the corresponding societies and like-minded people realizing that the British constitution could be similarly reimagined. And some radicals turn towards notions of regicide, very much energized by these political pamphlets, many of which were sold at the meetings or given out for free, um, including, for example, uh, one called K King Killing by Richard Citizen Lee, who demanded that his audience destroy the huge Colossus. And so I think ceramic reproductions of the guillotine are forming part of a landscape of political tools that cater to non-elite audiences, conveying how ordinary drinking vessels could support challenges to monarchical power structures in Britain. Um, one sort of exemplary guillotine scene appears in a pearlware cylindrical mug, which I'm showing you here. Um, and I think it's very much the outside of the mug is so, you know, kind of starkly juxtaposed with this decorative border of the stylized flowers that we see on the inner rim, which it would be quite interesting. Um, and the image that we see here, the printed scene, captures actually the moment before the king's execution itself has taken place. So the other one was, you know, immediately after, here kind of immediately before. Interestingly, this is actually coming from a broadside um, with a woodcut engraving by William Lane, which was entitled Massacre of the French King. Uh, so you can see how it's been sort of um, tran uh, transposed here with the addition of text and the removal of, of the clouds, for example, have, have been taken away that we see in the broadside. Interestingly, Leon actually made this woodblock before the death of Louis XVI by way of illustrating the new invention of the guillotine. Um, but here it is very much, uh, you know, uh, celebrating or, or marking the death of, of the French king. On the mug itself, the engraving has been scaled down and embellished with a textual inscription which reads, view of la guillotine or the modern beheading machine of Paris by which Louis XVI, late king of France, suffered on the scaffold January 21st, 1793. So the pot engraver and the printer likely intended this mug to represent the fall of the monarchy. So with this in mind then, such handheld ceramics can very much be read or could be read, I argue, or would like to suggest as forms of pro-revolutionary propaganda used perhaps to cement radical imaginings of the death of King George III. In fact, the laboring classes were frequently accused of uttering treasonable expressions about the English king, King George, um, such uh, reg regis Reg regidal, um, uh, imaginings were taken seriously um, during one court case in 1796 and Mr Thomas Robert Crossfield was charged with having compassed and imagined the death of the king and one of the witnesses who was cross-examined during this case even confessed to owning a paper entitled the guillotine or George's head in a basket and he admitted that he had acquired that from a committee of correspondence. So I suppose what I'm trying to ask here is, could the act of drinking from a tankard like this, printed with the guillotine or the sign and the scenes of the guillotine, be viewed similarly as a treasonous act? Certainly, such detailed and small handheld ceramics have the potential to set conversation topics within the social space of the tavern, um, in which politics intersected with sociability on a daily basis. 
we know that political toasts and rising songs frequently occurred in these sociable spaces and several popular, popular songs at the time in England responded to the French Revolution. So one, for example, written in 1793 was called The Permanent Guillotine. And uh, this was a song um, all about celebrating the machine's invention, the guillotine's invention. Um, and there were also other kind of ballads written, um, for example, John Gilpin's Ghost, written in 1794 by the well-known orator John Thilwell, or Thelwell. Um, in that ballad, he writes that a disembodied voice states that all tyranny must bow. As writers such as uh, John Mead, but also Amanda Goodrich have contended, radical toasts Dami McKing were also frequently made in taverns, with some supported by ceramic wares on hand. So for example, we know that on one such occasion, Thewell, in attendance at a London Corresponding Society meeting, supposedly blew the head off his pot of porter and declared, thus I would serve all kings. So here he physically has a tankard, a, a, a mug such as we might see, uh, such as the one we would see here, and the metaphor of blowing off the frothy foam traditionally found on a porter, which was sometimes known as a froth crowned porter, invokes the imagined beheading of the King of England. So through this sociable act of toasting, users may have engaged in a form of treasonous performance, whereby radical ideologies emerged, furthered perhaps by the printed ceramics held in their hands. A notable printed execution scene also features on this greenware, um, creamware baluster shaped eel dog, but which, which is probably produced in Liverpool. It's transfer printed in red enamel, and I think the colour almost echoes the red blood spilling from the beheaded body and the separated head in, in the original print as well. So the jug scene, uh, perhaps already known to some of you, uh, scales down a full color print by Isaac Cruikshanks, published by SW4s only a few weeks after the death of Louis XVI, alongside a notice which states the martyr of equality, representing the axe down and the body on the board, um, with the Duke of Orléans holding by the hair the king's head to the populace, explaining the whole the progress of our system. So here we've got our oval form, um, in an oval form of the, the image of the jug on the jug, uh, and it's enclosed with interlaced bands of laurel leaves tied with a ribbon. And the actual decorative motif that we see surrounding the image is very much um, thought to be uh, stylistically reminiscent of work produced in uh, Liverpool. So um, quite often these laurel leaves appear frequently on, on political scenes found in Liverpool pottery um, that were produced there. And once again here, the scene very much dwells on the immediate aftermath of the execution of Louis XVI, focusing on the central figure of Philippe um, de Gall of Egalité, the former Duke of Orléans, and the King's cousin, of course, who we know was responsible for condemning Louis to death. And he holds the severed head triumphantly. Now, Cruikshank's source print is often read as a form of sympathetic counter-revolutionary propaganda, or what Reich Hart and Noel have termed, a satirical lamentation. On the one hand, this print reads as a shock tactic for the British public, encouraging viewers to fear the dangers associated with equality and democracy, as if such a fate would similarly befall King George III. On the other hand, Cruikshank's print can register a violent visual satire that could incite anti-French and anti-revolutionary sentiment, given that the Duke had portrayed his own cousin and his king. However, the scaling down of revolutionary iconography onto an ale jug such as this, made in Liverpool, a regional city very much rife with radical beliefs in the 1790s, I do think opens up other interpretations. Whilst the progress of the French system, uh, which is written on the jug, could here refer to the guillotine itself or the triumph of the French people over the aristocracy, I think it also gestures towards the possibility of democratic revolution within Britain if it too could succeed in overthrowing the monarchy. A consideration, therefore, of the complexities of the material, textual and visual nature of this object requires us to understand not only the political economy of design in which it was produced, but also how it might have been consumed by the non-elite classes in and around Liverpool or in similar cities within the social space 
of the tavern. Through the process of scaling down and manipulating large scale events, therefore, these ceramics encoded, were encoded with a multiplicity of meanings and constituted a visual shorthand for current events, acting as political and historical agents. Through a haptic interpretation, which inquired, required significant close looking and handling, the user may have gained a better understanding of the scene at hand and the key figures who were involved in the final moments of King Louis XVI's life. Produced immediately following the death of the French king, these handheld ceramics had the capacity to shape both an individual and a collective understanding of the emerging history of the French Revolution in England. And in fact, they soon became collectible historicist objects during the 19th century, uh, when they were sort of taken up as a historical record of the British response. According to the ceramic scholar Gustave Gullien, who writes in 1872, he says that the history of the French Revolution set imprimé puissamment sur les choses de la ceramique. Similarly, the British ceramics collector Henry Willett, writing in 1899, says that his collection of ceramics has been formed, and I quote, with a view to develop the idea that the history of the country may to a large extent be traced on its homely pottery. As engravers tweaked and interpreted existing prints, they may have thought to encourage a sentimental, sympathetic reaction to the violent treatment of the French monarchy. Other printed ceramics perpetuated the guillotine as the pervading emblematic symbol of the French Revolution, encouraged by and perhaps even contributing to a pro-revolutionary sentiment, especially amongst the laboring and middling classes. Nonetheless, perhaps the time has come to distance ourselves from this stark binary of pro or counter-revolutionary political rhetoric in Britain during the mid-1790s. So, for example, in recent years, two printed creamware ale jugs have appeared on the art market, showing um, a pairing of these two starkly slightly different images of the last farewell or final interview with the family and the guillotine of Louis XVI. So there's one image on either side of the jug. And this is incredibly rare. It's not very um, often that you see the objects that we still have today of, of French revolutionary printed ceramics. It's not very often that you see both of these scenes printed onto the one vessel, suggesting that perhaps this could have been uh, produced with a particular agenda and cultural aesthetic in mind. The circulation of these events with a particular uh, further, sorry, the circulation of these events on one object further demonstrates their place as two of the most popular moments in the history of the French Revolution. So the user of such jugs could engage in a tactile relationship with these famous political events that fit easily into their hands. They may have even poured eel from one of these vessels into an accompanying mug with similar revolutionary images. So I think this just sort of shows the complex material forms that are happening at this point as these relatively inexpensive vessels for eel uh, were used during intimate sociable conversations, perhaps assuming pivotal roles and acts of toasting the singing of songs or treasonous gestures amid rising political unrest. Perhaps users of these mugs and jugs rejoiced in the gore and guts of French politics, whilst also fearing for their own supposedly beloved French uh, English king. Or perhaps these objects inspired a much more radical response. Whatever the outcome within the tavern space, such examples indicate the very slipperiness of these ceramics, potentially anti-French, counter-revolutionary, pro-revolutionary, anti-monarchy, anti-democracy, their meaning ultimately determined by those who held them in their hands. So to conclude very quite rapidly, overall, I believe that by finally interrogating such objects with critical eyes, we can offer two things. Firstly, I think we can really think about a reorientation of the marginalized role of ceramics in the broader disciplinary fields of history, art history, and material culture studies in relation to the study of the French Revolution, both in France and in Britain. And secondly, I think we can pay even greater attention to the circulation of the images and the smaller things linked to the French Revolution, and thus query the embodied interactions that are happening between humans and the objects in such a complex political moment as this one, where such objects possess the potential to inform the political and historical consciousness 
of the users who held them in their hands. Almost perhaps if they are really uh, you know, linked to propaganda, like handheld grenades ready to explode and inspire um, at any given moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline, for that fascinating, wide ranging and very, very rich talk. Um, I'll ask you to stop sharing your screen, please. Lovely. Now, we will, we've will we got some time for audience questions. If you'd like to ask a question, you can do it in two ways. You can go down, navigate to the bottom of your screen where it says reactions and raise your hand. If you prefer, you can type your question in the chat and I can read it out for you. So while people are thinking about the questions and um, raising their hands, and I see Rembrandt already has a question. I'm just going to ask one question, if I may. I've got lots, but I won't take up the time. So you touched on this a little bit when you were discussing Liverpool. I wondered if there was any um, evidence of which areas of the country these items were particularly popular in. I mean, not in terms of being manufactured, but in terms of being consumed. Yeah, it's a really... Um... It's a really interesting question. And actually, I would say it is important thinking about where they were actually being manufactured. So one of the middle guillotine mugs that I showed, which had the decorative border, for many decades, it's been thought that's actually was met in Swansea. Um, but uh, in the last couple of years, um, and through speaking with a lot of colleagues, it's, it's definitely not. And there was sort of a point where I was thinking, okay, are we getting towards a Welsh um, reaction or response to, the, to these images, uh, but it does seem to be a very English centered thing. So actually I think the manufacture in terms of the location is, is really interesting. The reality is that we, we just, it's very difficult to, to really fully understand how many were produced and, and where. I mean, I think realistically we're talking the major cities. So London, Liverpool, Sheffield, um, they're being made definitely within Staffordshire Pottery's area as well, and then potentially circulated elsewhere. Um, they've ended up across in the US as well. So there's kind of an American dynamic to this too, which um, I, I, you know, I really haven't gone into at all. But there's definitely archaeological excavations of these types of objects ending up in on, on the East Coast, I think, um, for the most part. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting um, that I think, unfortunately, because of this um, slightly more mass produced type of ceramic that they were, the records for them really don't exist in the same way. Great, thank you. Rembrandt? Uh, yeah, hi, uh, thank you. That was a really, really fascinating. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I have, I, it certainly raised several questions in me, uh, one of which you already began to answer because I was wondering about, do we know anything at all about the numbers in which these items were produced are we talking about dozens hundreds thousands uh, and uh, yeah can we judge that by the surviving uh, 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 well exemplars and uh, uh, another question that uh, uh, came up with me immediately was uh, the, the surviving copies do they show signs of actual use could these also have been collectors' items like modern souvenir marks? Um, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Rembrandt. Um, in terms of the number, it's uh, really, really difficult to know because of the records. There really aren't very many existing, um, but that's so difficult to say if that's actually a sign of, you know, that there weren't that many made. Uh, with some of the other sort of political events that are similarly commemorated in, in printed ceramic where things like, you know, the, when we get to the Battle of Trafalgar or Battle of the Nile, there are a huge number of those still existing. Um, but I, my gut feeling, having looked at, at more generally different types, is that they probably were produced in, in the hundreds, if not more, and perhaps into the thousands and also they would have been used so I think you know there's a fragility there particularly if we're seeing them within the space of the tavern which is where they would have been used then you know actually probably many of them wouldn't have survived they really don't end up in the art market until the end of the 19th century as you know kind of collector's items if you will and um, that's something that really doesn't seem to happen to those types of objects until the end end of the 19th century um, and even then, there's really only a handful of them that still exist. So my, my gut is that they were produced rapidly, 
very quickly, you know, almost immediately following the, the kind of production of prints. And they were used and perhaps used in quite boisterous, potentially boisterous settings. But again, it's difficult to know for, for definite. That's, that's sort of my gut, I suppose. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Great, thank you. So while we're seeing if there's any more questions from the audience, I'm going to ask a couple more. And um, please forgive me because this comes probably from my complete ignorance of the subject matter. But I had a couple of questions. So um, one is about the type of imagery used. Um, were there ever any sort of what we would in today's terms called rights issues with using certain types, uh, certain images from certain pamphlets or so was that perhaps a barrier for some imagery being used or in fact a reason on the opposite in the opposite way a reason for other imagery to be used so that's my first question and um, my uh, second question is about um gender and the gender of people who are um using the objects um and perhaps less so who are making the objects but it would be interesting uh to know if you've got any comments about either of those issues yeah, um, thanks so much. In terms of the use of the images, you know, the kind of almost book, I guess, modern term kind of like copyright of them. Um, not, there doesn't seem to be any, uh, the very, there don't seem to be any instances where people have been annoyed at, um, you know, cop, you know, it, people putting print, prints from kind of broadsides or periodicals onto copper engraved plates and then sending them out. Um, what you do have is you have people who are making the copper plates um, tend to kind of have, you know, a huge number and then they sell the sell it for X amount. So actually they're making money rather than whoever had done the initial printed image. Um, but no, not, not specifically have I found any instances of that, of that being a problem. Uh, at this point. And then the second question about gender is a really interesting one. John Mee's work uh, on the kind of sociability of the 18th century tavern and thinking about that, um, it's probably the best place to start because actually men and women were very much going to the space of the tavern and um, people much, uh, I'm trying to think who else, but I think there has been work done on women involved in the corresponding societies. And we know that women were actively there. Um, so yeah, that's it's quite difficult to really determine, I suppose, who were actually using them. In terms of making them, women were very much involved in the ceramics manufacturing processes, uh, more so in the 19th century in England than, than at this point. But um, you know, definitely you could have had women who were um, involved in the printing process at this point as well. Um, but I would say lesser so than that was mostly men, or at least the people that we have signed for pop printers for these objects are all men, definitely. Great, thank you. Um, so do we have any other questions? Yes, Rembrandt, I was just going to ask you. Yeah, I, I, I have some more, <laughs> I wish I was holding back, thinking that perhaps other people should go first. But um, uh, first of all, with this particular genre of the revolutionary mugs, I mean, um, uh, the, the, the examples you've shown, they're clearly, as you said, part of a, a, a larger mass produ production. Uh, are, are there any similar objects that are sort of, sort of more, what one could say, upmarket? Or, or is it really limited to this type of uh, fa fairly let's say, affordable type of collection? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's actually something I'd like to look more at as I kind of expand the project, um, because I've been so fo focused on the transfer printed wares. Um, I suppose the quick answer is yes, um, but how kind of morbid or macabre were they? Um, and also it's interesting what was happening, you know, at the moment, this is very much focused on what was being made and produced and consumed within England, but then you've got the French, mm equivalent um I mean we know you know the guillotine was made into guillotine earrings you know in 1793 <laughs> 94 straight away and you know they were quite um you know good kind of um quality materials that are being used but you have a sort of actually more running parallel going for slightly lower classes or, or kind of more affordable goods 
Um, in France, you have French faience, which is not porcelain, it's ceramic, it's cheaper, it's tin glaze earthenware, and they make huge numbers of those to kind of um, signify the kind of battle of Bastille uh, to kind of show, um, you know, life or death and, and things like Egality, Fraternité, Liberté goes on them. Uh, the Royal Factory in just outside of Paris, which has been previously owned by the king um, at Sèvres, is nationalised in during the French Revolution in 1793. But they've got all of this old stock of incredibly expensive, very high quality porcelain that's blank or, you know, hasn't been fully decorated. And so in the middle of the 1790s, um, the revolutionary government takes over the previously royal factory and they start making wares with different revolutionary symbols and motifs on them. Um, and that has quite a good market for that in Paris, but also a lot of that's coming over to England at the same time. So actually, mm. I suppose the more elite objects aren't necessarily being made in England. Um, through ceramics that at the moment from what I can see very quickly but I'm sure there are examples I've just not looked at it but there's definitely something happening in Paris both with cheaper ceramics and also the more high-end uh, porcelain as well at Sèvres. Right yeah uh, yeah yeah another question that uh, that I had was uh, uh, because you you now focused on uh, the 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 end of Louis the <laughs> But uh, as the revolution progressed, uh, were other themes highlighted in in English production, or or was that it? Was was the was it the morbid fascination fascination yeah. with the, the guillotine? It's a, good, it's a really good question. Um, other people, other people were more more so than theme events and themes. So, so for example, Wedge, Josiah Wedgwood, um, you know, very well known, you know, very much producing much more elite ceramics. He does portrait, miniature portrait medallions of people like um, Duke Dornier, like Philippe Galité and um, people like Mirabeau and, and kind of these key figures involved in the French Revolution are immortalized in uh, Wedgwood at that point. And that's um, actually, again, that's got a big American market, I think, of who's buying that. Quite interesting. Uh, but they're made in England, in, in you know, in Stoke-on-Trent, um, well, in Barliston. Um, and there's also this Wedgwood kind of French connection that continues at that point as well. Um, but I do, yeah, I mean, we kind of, it's probably a much larger conversation really, but I think we, the difficulty I have with some of these objects is we keep coming back to this motif as the guillotine as the only thing that the French Revolution is. Um, mm. and, you know, and people like Richard Tolls have written so much on this and as the guillotine is an anti-monument and, and actually can we just reduce this massive political, historic, incredibly complex event down to this object or this motif almost like we see it here. But I think actually the ceramics just show that that was, um, that was sort of how, what was happening at that moment of popular culture, um, whether, you know, we want to see it like that today through history and there's other ways of reading it uh it's they really seem focused on those two events um in particular yeah. it yeah. was certainly what what drew attention was it this beheading machine yeah well exactly and you can see you can see why from both the kind of concern for the structures that exist half you know people kind of blindly or happily exist within england and then also the kind of radical concern for actually maybe this is a, giving us momentum to do something uh you know on both uh, sides. And uh, uh, was it also simply a fascination with the fact that this is this is a machine, basically? So it's a, okay. it's a, it's a, a technological invention. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. What were they thinking? Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, we have a question that has come into the chat from Simon. Um, he asks, you mentioned Wedgwood commenting on the revolution. Have you found any other examples of Staffordshire or Liverpool factory owners expressing public political opinions that may have influenced their output? Thanks, Simon. Um, it's a really good question. I started sort of going through the idea of trying to figure out if any of the pop printers or makers or engravers were based in the corresponding societies. Um, and I sort of didn't really get as 
far I didn't really get very far and then sort of COVID happened and this pro I really this is me sort of really trying to pick up this project now so it's something I'd like to look at in a lot more detail but then the difficulty is you know a lot of the, the people involved in the corresponding societies it was anonymous but at the moment I can't see any obvious connections but there must have been some sort of connection and also I think um you know the interlinks or interconnections between printed ceramics and print culture and newspapers and the people who control the, the information and the news, you know, they are very, very much closer linked than I think we think of normally um, or, you know, don't necessarily think of straight away. So I think there must be something more to be said there um, because they were, you know, so geographically and politically, I suppose, and commercially like like minded. So I'd like to look more into that. But, yeah, it's a really, really good point. Great, thank you. Well, if we don't have any more questions, um, I think we should let Caroline go after what was a very, very interesting lecture. I've just put um, a few links in the chat, um, which is where you can find out further information about um, our upcoming events, because we should have a few more events this year. But uh, before we do anything else, I would really like to thank Caroline for um, her talk this evening which was absolutely fascinating and for um, the, giving us the time to take part in our series. So thank you very much, Caroline. Thanks so much, Louisa, and thanks everyone for coming. And, and it's a lot at six o'clock on, on the Monday, so thank you.